Good evening. You're listening to Booked for the Night. I'm your narrator, Melissa Phillips. Tonight I'm reading chapters 26 through 28 of The Jumbies by Tracy Batiste. Thanks and enjoy. Chapter 26. Quiet Morning. There was no way for Corinne and the boys to find Drew. They were hemmed in by Jumbies and villagers fighting. Instead, the three found their way back to the baker's outdoor oven and slumped to the ground in a heap leaning against each other to keep their backs and heads upright in case of an attack. But in moments, they had all fallen asleep from exhaustion. Several hours later, all three of them woke up on flour sacks on the floor of the bakery. Hugo, the baker, was asleep on a chair barring the front door. The thick, oar-like pallet that he used to put the bread into the brick oven was lying across his lap. The flat end was cracked and splintered. Hugo didn't look much better. His arm was slashed in places as if he had been mauled by a lagahu. While the baker continued to sleep, Corinne opened one of the windows, and she and the boy slipped outside. In the bright midday light, the remains of the battle were revealed in sharp, horrible detail. The village was in shambles. Torn bits of cloth lay everywhere. Dust circled in the air. Stones, broken pieces of wood, tufts of fur, Branches, bricks, burned-out torches, and broken lanterns were strewn along the road, in yards, and around the open market. In some places, little piles of ash, with tiny wisps of smoke still curling above them, began to blow away in the breeze. Every now and then, the children stepped over gory tracks where the wounded had been dragged off into the woods. Whether the victims were human or jumpy, they could not tell. Although the sun was already high in the sky, the three of them were the only ones outside. The island had never been so quiet. They're gone for now, Corinne said. We have until tonight to, to, to think of what to do. What can we do, Buki said. They are stronger than us. They can make giant killer weeds grow up out of the ground in seconds. They have claws and razor sharp teeth and fur. Everything has a weakness, Corinne said. Remember, Drew said they can't come out during the day. Severine can, Drew said. Drew! Corinne re rushed to hug her. You're okay! Drew didn't hug her back. Her hair was unbraided and waved in the wind, and there was a strange look in her eyes. What happened? Corinne asked. They were everywhere, Drew said. I made it all the way home, and I peeped out of a hole in the wall near my bed. I saw them come out of the forest and start banging down doors and fighting with my neighbors. Then a little band of doings started to pitch marbles in the street. My neighbor, Alan, she paused and looked at Corinne. He came out to play with them. I wanted to scream at him not to go, but I didn't want them to know where I was. So I just watched. As soon as he picked up a marble to pitch, they started saying, oh, 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 and next thing, Alan was saying it too. Corinne gasped. What happened? His mother came out and tried to call him back. So then the Jumbies knew his name. They called him and he followed them into the forest. His mother called him again, but he couldn't go to her. Why not? Buki asked. When he turned back toward his mother, his legs didn't turn with him. They were still walking toward the forest while the rest of him was facing his mother. I stopped looking then. I could still hear all the fighting, but I couldn't watch anymore. Corinne tried to shake off the cold feeling that was crawling up her spine. Then she whispered, I'm sorry. Drew cast an accusing eye at Corinne, but said nothing. Malik hung his left arm at his side and hobbled for a few steps. That's no use. We tried to talk to the witch before, Corinne said. She didn't want to help. Malik waved his hand at the destruction all around them. You're right, brother, Buki said. Things are different now. The white witch doesn't care, Corinne said. Maybe it's you she doesn't want to help, Drew said. You were the one who went running into the mahogany forest where everyone knows there are jumbies. You were the one who had that jumbie in your house. Maybe the witch just didn't want to help you. She bit down hard on her trembling lip. It's not my fault that Miss Severin followed me out of the forest. And if you're looking for somebody to blame for sending me in there, she pointed a finger at Buki. Me? How was I supposed to know that stupid goody would go that way? Malik stamped his foot so hard that the curls on his head shook. 
He pointed toward the forest and then back at the village. Then he put his hands on his hips. Okay, you're right, Malik, Corinne said. They could come back again. So how do we find the witch? Chapter 27, The Swamp No human had ever seen the witch's house, but everyone knew that it was hidden in a swamp of stinking water, surrounded by mangrove trees so thick that some said they were enchanted to make sure no one got through. No one had ever attempted to trek to see the witch in her lair, until now. Corinne, Drew, Buki, and Malik journeyed north around the coast of the island toward the mouth of the largest river. About mid-afternoon, they finally heard the sound of churning water where the river mingled with the sea. They turned and followed it deeper into the island. The farther they went, the more they got crowded in by mangrove trees. The children waded in the water, swatting away thick swarms of flies, because the big, gray roots were too dense on either bank for even their small feet. The water was not much better. Mangrove roots arched down like giant, aged fingers and tripped them as they walked. Then, as the trees began to come in even closer, growing directly out of the river, the water became still and turned to swamp. The murky, greenish water of the swamp seemed to stretch on forever around them. Corinne stopped and looked around at the still water and the ancient trees with their tangled roots. She held her nose and breathed through her mouth to avoid the stink. Besides the horrible stench, there was no way to tell how deep the water would get, or behind what groves of trees the witch's hut stood, or even what creatures watched, hidden in the trees or under the water. It took her several heartbeats before she could take another step forward. The others waited for her. They moved only when she did. Bits of thick, brown, oily muck clung to their clothes as they went. Behind them, they left a trail of muck-free, greenish water. Something's on me! It's on me! Drew screamed. Get it off! Stop it! You're splashing the slime on me, Drew, Buki said. Get it off! Drew screamed. There's nothing on you, Corinne said to Drew. You're imagining things. You got nasty swamp water in my mouth, Buki complained. Stop with all that splashing. Corinne put both her hands on Drew's shoulders, as much to steady her own quaking body as to calm Drew down. We'll be out soon. It's not so bad. Look, it's clearing up ahead. Malik tapped his brother's shoulder and pointed out a snake curled on a branch overhead. Corinne saw it too. It was barely noticeable, only a slightly paler shade of green than the leaves around it. Then it unfurled and stretched itself toward the water. Looks like we're going to be in that clearing sooner than you think, Buki said. He cut through the swamp as fast as he could go, splashing up vile smelling water. Malik followed close behind. Corinne trailed a little, pulling Drew along. The long green snake touched down in the water. It began to slither toward them in a curving line over the surface of the swamp. It was fast. All four of them screamed and beat a rapid path away from the snake. Come on, come on, Buki shouted from up ahead. When they were finally away from the trees, the ground beneath them dropped suddenly and they were forced to swim. Buki struck out for the middle of the swamp with Malik close behind. Corinne pushed Drew ahead of her and followed, paddling hard. They cleared the mangrove in the muck, but they all continued to swim frantically until Buki called. It's okay. It's gone. They were all covered in nasty-smelling slime and wet, cold, and panting from exhaustion. The witch's house was still nowhere in sight. We're wasting time, Corinne said. We should go back. Malik reached his hand out and pointed behind her. There, in the middle of the clearing, was a tiny island. It was not much more than a muddy mound rising out of the center of the swamp with a small shack on top. Corinne smiled. Good eye, Malik. Corinne led the way toward the little island. Near its shore, a mossy row of rocks rose out of the water and made a path toward the witch's hut. It was hard for them to pull themselves up onto the slippery rocks. Several times they lost their footing and wound up back in the water. Only Malik seemed to make progress, as if he had grips on the soles of his feet. How does the old witch do it? Buki asked after he fell in yet again. She's a witch! She uses magic, Drew said. Maybe the rocks are only slippery for us. Maybe when she's walking on them, it's a regular road, Buki said a moment before he fell back into the water up to his neck. As Corinne slipped into the water again, Malik moved past her on nimble feet. 
How are you doing that? she asked, but Malik only snickered. Buki got back up on the rocks. She does this with a tray of potions balanced on her head? Like I said, it's magic, Drew said. I could use some magic, Buki complained. At last, they all made it to the witch's door. Corinne knocked three times, hard. They dripped swamp water on the witch's front step and waited. The crooked door wobbled open, and the witch peered through it. She studied the slime-covered children carefully. You again, she asked. Her voice grated like a boat scraping along gravel. She turned back inside the shack and left the door open. Corinne watched the bright colors of her house dress darken in the shadows of the hut. She hesitated at the door. I won't eat you, the witch said from inside. She began to laugh but ended up coughing instead. Corinne went in first and the others followed her. The house was only one room. On shelves along the crooked walls, there were glass, clay, and wooden containers of various shapes and sizes. The floor was bare wood rubbed smooth from countless years of the old woman's shuffling feet. The witch gestured to a rough-hewn table and bench in the middle of the room. Sit! She moved to the opposite side and returned to filling and sorting the ingredients in her potions. Why wouldn't you help us when we came to you in the market yesterday? Corinne demanded. I didn't know then what she wanted, the witch replied. Her shoulders drooped toward the floor. Her deep brown skin, which already had lines and grooves like the bark of a tree, seemed to crease even more deeply. I tried to warn you, Corinne said. I knew she was going to try something to hurt us all. Drew put her hands on her hips. You knew? Well, my friends knew, Corinne corrected herself, but I came to you and you did nothing. The witch shuffled over to a shelf. As she went, her long yellow toenails, toenails clicked on the wooden floor. She scratched at the shiny brown bald splats between her white braids. At her side, her left arm hung, withered and limp. She didn't seem like someone powerful, someone who could help. With some difficulty, the witch rolled a piece of paper into a funnel with her good arm and poured red seeds into small bottles. She stuck a cork in each one and put them on a tray. Malik reached out a finger toward a slip of paper that held a tiny hill of black pods. Do you like your fingers the way they are? The witch snapped. Malik froze. The witch shook her head at him and he pulled his hand back into his lap. In that moment, she looked like her previous self, powerful, self-assured, and able. So what do you want me to do now? She asked without looking at any of them. I need to get past the jumbies, Corinne said. Ha! <laughs> The witch replied with contempt. How do you plan on doing that? Can't you help me? You get past them all the time. The jumbies don't have anything to fear from me, and there's nothing I have that they want, the witch said. I also don't go around fighting them and trying to set fire to their homes, so they trust me. If you can say the same thing, then you can also get past them. Isn't there some trick? Corinne asked. The witch shook her head and her white braids tossed around. Then can't you just get rid of the jumbies? Corinne asked. Me? You people have too much faith in what I can do. You could if you wanted to, Corinne said. What are all of these for? She gestured to the bottles, seeds, and leaves on the table. Some people need these things. Right now, people need to get rid of all those jumbies. What do you have here for that? Nothing said the white witch. Severine has put some kind of magic on my papa. He doesn't even know what's happening around him. And now there's a poisonous vine wrapped around my house. What do you have for that? You have any jumpy weed killer on this table? Buki asked with a grin. He nudged his brother and drew, but no one laughed. The witch shot him a nasty look and he pretended to smooth out a knot on the wood table. I told you that was a bad one, and now she has completely taken over your house? The witch shook her head and clucked her tongue. Women and men live together all the time, she said finally. You should try to get along with your new mother. She's not my mother, Corinne, Corinne shouted. She clenched her fist to stop them from shaking. Do you understand? She's taking my papa. She's changing him. You're the only person who can help. Don't tell me you're just going to stand there and do nothing. I can't stand around and watch him become a... Corinne hesitated. A jumbie, 
Drew finished with a firm nod. Curran shot her an angry look. He isn't a jumbie. He doesn't know who he is. I could probably make him better if I could only get into my house when she isn't there. Past her poison weed? The witch asked. Corinne folded her arms around herself. You must have something here I can use. She's stronger than me, and she's turned on everyone else. Didn't you hear them all last night? This is our island, and they're kind are trying to take over. They're kind? The witch asked. What kind is that? She looked at Corinne beneath one cocked white eyebrow. The kind of thing that comes out of the forest last night, Corinne said slowly. Their kind, your kind, is there a difference? They are trying to kill us, Drew said. They belong to this island, child. You cannot get rid of them. They are part of it. You don't like it when someone moves into your house for an afternoon. The witch said to Corinne, how would you like it if someone moved in, shoved you and your family into the deepest pockets of the island, and refused to leave for a couple hundred years? And what if those new people forgot that you were even there? And when they found you again, they feared you and tried to kill you off. How would you like that? Corinne looked down at her hands in her lap. Severine had told her the same thing. With a small voice, she said, they're not like regular people. But she understood about losing her home, and she was willing to fight for it, the same as Severine. I'm not like regular people either, the witch said. Will you be trying to get rid of me next? Corinne searched the witch's face. How are you different? I'm as different as you are, she said, eyeing Corinne. Corinne stiffened. Her eyes darted to her friends to see if they understood what the witch meant. They're taking children, Drew pleaded. They're probably going to get these two boys next. They don't even have parents to look after them. Hey, Buki said. It's true, you don't, Drew said. But she didn't want to scare Malik too much, so she smiled at him and patted his hand a little. Look, Corinne said, we know Severine wanted something from one of your little bottles here. Whatever magic she used on my papa probably came from right here. You made this mess, Buki banged his fist on the wood table. Some of the bottles wobbled and clinked together. So you help us fix it. He tried to hold the witch's gaze, but when her eyes burned into his, he looked down at the table again and put his hands in his lap. You think I had something to do with that? You're wrong, the witch said. She didn't need any help turning your father. Men are turned by pretty faces every minute of every day. Buki nodded. I told her that, didn't I, brother? He asked Malik softly. Malik didn't even blink in response to his brother. Then what did she come to you for? Corinne asked. She came to me for a way to stay on the outside. Her kind can't live too long away from their own element. Corinne and Drew exchanged a look. How could you help her but not help us? Corinne asked. Now she's taken over my house, my mama's house. She's killing my papa. The words burned her throat. The witch sighed deeply. It is my vow. I cannot take sides. If I help one side, I have to help the other. So it's better to stay out of it entirely. I have helped your side plenty. I've done all I can do. What happens to you if you take sides? Corinne asked. You see how my arm has shriveled up, the witch said. Useless. Buki sucked his teeth. That happened to you when you went swimming in the river that day, when you nearly drowned yourself. You're not too smart, are you, boy? The witch sneered. Do you imagine I could have lived surrounded by water for over a hundred years and never have learned how to swim? She turned her attention to Malik. It must be very frustrating living with a dunce like this one. Malik's face broke into a brief smile that disappeared when he saw his brother's hurt face. Can't you fix your arm? Corinne asked. I don't have a remedy for her magic, the witch said. It's an old magic, far beyond what I know. What about my papa? The witch shook her head. And what would happen to me? What if I tried? Corinne asked in a low voice. Ah, I see. So you already know what you are then. The witch saw the confused looks on the faces of the other children. But you have not told your friends yet. 
Corinne looked down at the table. I don't believe it, she said softly. You believe it a little, I can tell. And you should. It's true. Your mother, Nicole, she was a jumbie, just like Severine, or the green woman, or whatever it is you call her. And she came to me once asking for help. Corinne shook her head. No. Only, she didn't tell me exactly what kind of help, so I'm not sure what I gave her worked the way she wanted it to. And when she didn't go home, the rest of her jumbie kin must have thought that living among the people did her in. Please, stop. But she lived, for a time anyway. She lived long enough to have you. And now somehow, her sister has found out about you and she sees her chance again. They were a pair, you see. Severine needs her family back. She is stronger with more of her kind surrounding her. Corinne remembered what Severine told her about how powerful they would be when they were a family again. She looked at her friends, at the way their mouths had gone slack with shock. She slapped the table with her palms and stood. Stop! My stopping won't change things. She will get rid of every single creature that stands in her way. And do you know why she's doing it? It's partly for losing the sister she loved, and she is capable of love, and partly because she never wanted people on this island in the first place. But mostly, it's because she knows that she can have an even larger Jumbie family, Some, because someone like you exists. One half Jumbie like me is just a fluke, an accident, but two of us? On either side of Corinne, the children's eyes widened with horror. Corinne kept shaking her head and hands as if she could toss the words back out, unhear the sound of Severine's voice telling her that she was part of the Jumby world, that she was the same as all the other creatures in the forest, and the witch telling her that it was all true. That can't be, Drew said into the silence. The witch raised one white eyebrow. Did it ever strike you as strange that her house is the only one that is built so close to the forest? And when the Jumbies do venture out at night, they have never visited it, even though it is the closest. Drew slid away from Corinne in tiny movements along the bench. You're not going to help us, are you? Buki asked as Corinne stood furious and silent facing the witch. The witch pressed her good fist against her hip. Everybody thinks they need magic. Everybody wants answers. Get rid of this boy. I'll help me find money. She doesn't love me anymore. Why won't my cane stalks grow as tall as my neighbors? Everybody wants a fast, easy solution. Maybe if you took care of your skin, you wouldn't have gotten the boil in the first place. Maybe if you worked harder, you would make more money. Maybe that person isn't the right one for you. Maybe if you found a better way to farm, your crop would come up better. But nobody wants to hear those things. They want a bottle. Instant success. Something to drink or sprinkle or spill on the ground. They want magic from nothing. Magic doesn't come from nothing. It comes from somewhere. And it isn't so extraordinary. It's just work. It's just using your head and your heart. She grabbed a seed and put it on the table, then grabbed a cleaver and hoisted it into the air. The children shrink back. She brought the cleaver down on the seed, slicing it in two. Look! See what's inside? Nothing. It's just a seed. But put it in the ground and water it and give it what it needs and something extraordinary happens. A seed is a promise. A guarantee, Corinne added, remembering her mama's words. She closed her eyes and this time she could almost hear her mother speak. The real magic is in what you do with it, the witch said. She put the two halves of the seed into Corinne's hand. It grows roots. It becomes hard to break. You feel it growing. You see when it's about to sprout and bud and bear fruit. You can feel it inside you. You know it like you know something is watching you from the shadows. It's instinct. This is your magic. Mine is of no use to you. The witch pushed Corinne's fingers closed around the seed and turned back to her work. What Severine took from me is probably wearing off already. If she hasn't figured out a way to live on the outside, she's going to have to go back home soon. That's the good news. I can't help her anymore. I won't. But she isn't just leaving, Corinne said. She's taking my papa with her. That is the bad news, the witch agreed. She's going to take as many of you with her as she can. 
Corinne said. You told me my mama came to you once. If she never came back, it means that she figured out a way to live in the open on her own. How did she do it? She had your father's love, and love is powerful. You can endure most things for love. It's like planting a seed. Every day it gets stronger and stronger. Every day it grew inside her. You mean like a baby? Corinne asked. You mean I helped my mama to live on the outside? It had to be you. She didn't have any other magic, but it couldn't have been easy for her. She fell in love and every day she had to push past the pain of living where she didn't belong. But like everything else, the harder something is, the stronger you become. You must have made her strong. Mothers are like that. Their children strengthen them. There was no trick. So how do we get rid of Severine, Buki asked. She doesn't have any children going inside her, does she? He screwed up his face in disgust. The witch laughed and then coughed again. She doesn't need to. La Diablesse, the Lagahu, the Duans, even the Sukayant, they are all her children already. What you are dealing with is much stronger than all of them. She is an ancient. She is their mother. She created all of them and they make her strong. You can't get rid of her, especially if she has found a partner to replace her sister. My papa? Corinne said with horror. Malik nudged Corinne gently, then he pulled one of his slingshot stones from his pocket to show her. My mama's stone pendant, Corinne said. It hurt Severin when she touched it. She took it away from me and put it up on the cliff. The white witch spilled a little of the dust she was pouring. What kind of stone? Small, black, round, Corinne answered. It must be important. All I need is a path through the mahogany forest to get it back. You have to be able to do that much. The witch faced her with fierce eyes. You keep forgetting about my arm. I am half jumby. I vowed never to pick sides, and for that I was able to gather my magic and live a long life. But now that I have broken my word, you see the consequences are harsh. I don't have much longer to live. She laughed, long and bitter. What do you think happened that day when the four of you were swimming in the river? What do you think withered my arm that afternoon? What do you imagine was trying to reach you from beneath the water? She watched the truth dawn on each of the children at her table. Yes, if I had left Severine to drown you all, maybe she would have been satisfied with that. Maybe she would have never learned that this little one here was a child like me. Maybe she wouldn't have figured out that people weren't as strong as she once thought. Then she would have returned to the forest and never come out again. I chose not to sacrifice you, but maybe I chose wrong. She knew what I was already, Corinne said. She knew when she followed me out of the forest into my mama's grave on All Hallows' Eve. Corinne remembered Hugo's warning that the other beings walked the earth that night. She had not believed in those things then. Even Drew had warned her to be careful of Severine. If she had listened all along. But it was too late now. The witch shrugged. No matter. But now you are going to have to choose as well. You have inherited your mother's magic. She protected you from the creatures in the forest for as long as she could. I don't know how her protection was broken or what made Severine follow you out. But now she knows. That means you can join her, you can try to fight her, or you can stand by and watch while the rest of the island figures it out. But whatever you choose will come back with a price. You will lose something. Your father, your friends, or your freedom. I will fight her, Corinne said. The white witch nodded. A noble choice, but you will lose. What about my papa? She needs a partner, someone to be her real family, not just another jumbie she can order around. The spell she worked on him would have had to be different than the usual tricks. She would have used a lot of magic. It would work slowly. The witch looked past them as if trying to figure it out. Three nights, then her magic will take hold. Don't let the sun rise after the third night. It has already been two, Corinne said. The witch pointed out the window. The sun was already descending in the sky. The third night was coming. If you plan to do something, make it quick. Chapter 28. Separate Ways 
The four left the swamp and made their way along the coast, away from the witch's shack. The river had mercifully washed most of the swamp stench from their clothes and hair, and the sun was beginning to dry them off. None of them spoke. Corinne noticed that Drew hung back a little from the group. She stopped suddenly and turned around to face Drew. What are you doing? Corinne asked. Nothing, Drew said softly. Why aren't you walking with the rest of us? I'm walking. Not with us. I'm right behind you, Drew protested. She pulled a long lock of hair to the front and began to play with it. Buki and Malik turned to look at the girls. Malik nudged his brother, and Buki rolled his eyes to the sky. Corinne asked, Are you trying to keep an eye on me? Do you think I'm going to work some kind of magic on you? No, Drew said, though she didn't sound too sure. You think I'm just like Severine or the Duans who took your friend away. You're afraid of me now, aren't you? I'm not scared, Drew said. You're scared of everything, Corinne said. I'm not, Drew insisted, but her lip began to quiver, so she bit down on it. I came with you to see the witch, didn't I? You stayed closest to the door the entire time, and as soon as the witch said that I, when she said what I was, you wanted to get away from me. Well, now's your chance. Go. I don't need you. Corinne's eyes began to sting with tears, so she blinked them back and stared, drew down while she waited to see what her friend would do. Drew looked from Corinne to the brothers, and then back to Corinne again. She clenched her fists. Everything is happening because of you. You are the one she wants, not us. You don't know what you're talking about, Drew, Corinne said. I wish we had never met. I wish I had never even laid eyes on you. Drew ran through the waves toward her village. Her long hair blew behind her. You pushed her away, Buki said to Corinne. Why did you have to go and do that? Corinne took one look at Malik's sad face as he watched Drew run off, and she slumped over with her hands balled into fists on her knees. The tears that she had tried to hold back flowed down her face. You can go too, Corinne said. I would get away from this mess if I could. That's exactly why we're staying, Buki said. You can't do everything yourself. I don't have any choice. My papa can't take care of me anymore. I have to take care of him. There's no one else to do it. No, there's one less, Buki said. You had three of us. Now you have two. You see what happened to my papa. You heard what the witch said. The people around me, the ones who try to protect me, they always get hurt. Even the witch. Who knows what will happen next? Don't you see? I have to work alone. Malik shook his head. What would you like me to tell her, brother? Buki said, sounding exasperated. She wants to go it alone. It's not like I can force her to let us help. It's better this way, Malik, Corinne said. You'll be safe. Malik shook his head again and stared at her, her with determination. Buki tried to ignore him. So what are you going to be able to do by yourself then? He asked. Corinne pulled herself up and took a deep breath. I'm going to do exactly what I should have done in the first place. I'm going to climb the cliff and get my mama's necklace back. And then what? You should have seen the look on Severine's face when she touched that stone and burned her hand. There's something about it. I'm going to figure it out. What if that doesn't work? Better to fight it out like we did last night. It's the only way. It isn't, Buki. I know the stone will help. I can just feel it inside me, like the witch said. When I had the necklace, I felt strong. I don't anymore. And why would Severine take it away if it wasn't important? It's the last night and my last chance, so it's time for a real plan. Severine knows exactly what she's doing. By dark tonight, we need to know exactly what we're doing, too. And my mama's necklace is step one. She gave the boys a firm nod. Malik clapped her back in agreement. Corinne gazed out at the water. I will need to row out to the cliff. But that fisherman, Victor, he will try to stop me if he sees me. The others might, too. Corinne looked at Buki and Malik. What's that look? Buki asked. What do you want us to do about a whole village full of fishermen? Malik nudged his brother. All right, we can distract the fishermen, Buki said. We'll find a way. Excitement tingled on Corinne's skin, from her toes all the way up to her scalp, now that they had a plan. But the weight of the events of the day felt heavy inside her. 
She could not imagine going it alone. Tears burned in her eyes again. Thank you, she said. Buki patted her on the shoulder. It would help more if there were three of us. He looked down the coast. Drew was long gone. Corinne's jaw tightened. She wanted to go, she said, but her eyes flicked down the coast too. Anyway, she has a whole family who will be sorry if something happens to her. Yet another advantage of being on your own, Buki replied. Each syllable of on your own pricked at Corinne's heart, but she had to concentrate on what needed to be done. So, how are you going to distract the fisherman? Malik pointed to his feet, then made a low peek over his head with his hands. Buki smiled and nodded. Don't worry, we have an idea. Thanks for joining us for tonight's edition of Booked for the Night. I'll be back tomorrow night with more of the Jumbies by Tracy Batiste. Thanks for listening and good night.